Welcome to the Unplayable Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be taking you through Australia's path to the T20 World Cup semi-finals as they've qualified, thanks to some results going their way, but also thanks to a very fine performance over the West Indies. My name is Josh Shonafinger. I'm joined by Louis Cameron, who watched all the action as well. Louis, welcome, mate. I did, Josh. It was a it was a dramatic evening, wasn't it? Well, there was lots going on, and there were two games, Australia versus West Indies first. Australia got the job done there. But then to ensure qualification, they needed to rely on the England and South Africa match going their way as well. And what needed to happen there, Louis, just run us through the basics. Yeah, so let's maybe start from the beginning of the night. Australia won pretty convincingly in the end over the West Indies uh, by eight wickets in Abu Dhabi, 22 balls of spare. So they increased their net run rate advantage over South Africa uh, from about 2.8, sorry, 0.2.89. I can't get those decimals right. It was (laughs) 0.289 at the uh, the start of the game. And they increased it to nearly half a point, which meant South Africa needed to win in the vicinity of about 60 runs, depending on how many how many they scored in their first innings after being sent in by Owen Morgan down the highway in Sharjah. They could hardly have done better, Josh. It was, uh, it was an incredible uh, batting performance from Rassi van der Dussen and Aidan Markram. Van der Dussen hit 94 not out of just 60 balls and Markham 52 not out of 25 balls. They smashed 10 sixes between them. They were targeting this short square boundary at Sharjah, playing right over to, to one end. And so they needed to keep England to 131 or fewer after they made two for 189. Um, and the Aussies, I reckon, would have been on the bus back to Dubai watching pretty closely, right? Because their t- fate in the <laughs> tournament uh, hung on the result of, of this game. Jason Roy did his hamstring in the power play, and, and that's going to be a really big story. Um, it's probably unlikely we'll see him again for the rest of the tournament, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought. England were then effectively 3 for 59, and it felt like it really could have gone either way. Thankfully for Australia and unluckily for South Africa, England did enough. Liam Livingston plonked a couple over the fence. Mel- Milan held steady, and Kagiso Rabada was very expensive, although he did reclaim himself later on. Um he, uh, he took a final over hat-trick, uh, but it was all for nothing. And poor old South Africa exited the tournament with four wins. they have beaten the tournament favourites and only one loss to Australia, which in the end proved uh, proved the difference between making the semifinals and not. They must consider themselves pretty unlucky. As you said, four wins and one loss. And unfortunately, they were one of three sides who finished on that on that win-loss ratio and they were the unlucky one who missed out. And maybe, as I've seen some discussion on Twitter as well, they were a bit slow in some of their chases, particularly against Bangladesh earlier in the tournament. That may have cost them. So it just goes to show that in these tournaments, every single run and every single over does matter. It does, 100%. And, yeah, I mean, it's it's the kind of thing that teams don't start thinking about the net run rate until, you know, it looks like they're up against it. But, gee, South Africa, they've just got a record in, in major events. It normally goes a, a different way where it's ultimately their fault, you know, the the fact that they, they bow out of these tournaments. But yeah, there's, there's really, I mean, apart from what you've said there about maybe reeling in a run chase a little bit quicker, there's not a whole heap more you felt that could have done. No, certainly not. Um, in that match that Australia won over South Africa in their opening match of the tournament, Josh Hazelwood was instrumental. He took a number of key wickets and he was also very good last night against the West Indies, taking four for 39, even though there was 20 runs off his first over. But look, even though he was sort of out of the T20 frame for the last, uh, let's say, 12 months ago, he's certainly rocketed back into that and he's now a key bowler for Australia, isn't he? It was a really interesting performance by him and, and a really brave decision, I thought, by Aaron Finch to throw him the ball for a second over in the power play after he had got whacked for, for 19 or 20 off his first over. He got the wickets of uh, Nicholas Puran and Rosson Chase with an absolute peach of a delivery that kind of just swung away a little bit, almost hovered in the air and then nipped back off the pitch and hit his off stump. Poor old Rosson Chase was was on his way for a globe after just two balls. And, of course, if you haven't seen that wicket of Rosson Chase yet, do jump onto cricket.com.au and check it out because certainly one of the balls of the tournament for me. It, yeah, for, for me too, I think. And uh, Josh Hazel would be uh, watching that one back for, for years to come, I would not have thought. I would have thought. Um, so it was a pretty solid bowling effort from Australia. They did concede 58 from their last five overs, which you thought could be costly at the time, but uh, ultimately it wasn't. Adam Zampa, superb, one for 20, only went at five and over. Um, and, and the big question mark over Australia all tournament has been, uh, you know, their, their fifth bowler and A, whether they want to play 
a, a fifth specialist bowler and B, if they don't, how will they get the overs out of Maxwell, Marsh and Stoinis? As it turned out, Maxwell and Marsh just went for 22 from their combined four overs and um, Marsh had a, had a fantastic game. And, um, yeah, it's uh, it's a good sign for the Aussies going into a semi-final and a final where you, you'd think they probably wouldn't want to tempt fate by changing the balance of this team, especially after Marsh's innings. Yeah, I agree. And it was the first time we'd seen Marsh with the ball this tournament and he from his three overs, just none for 16. And he, sure, he may, may have bowled at a more uh, preferable time, but he did have to... Bowling, you know, these are some destructive hitters. So he gave nothing away and really positive signs for the, the balance of this Australian eleven. Yeah, you might say it's a, a preferable time um, and they're probably going to use him, you know, more of those early middle over role as opposed to Stoinis, who I think they um, can use as a death bowler from time to time. It, it was interesting, Marsh, during the series in the West Indies, the five-match T20 series earlier this year, the Windies really targeted him and, you know, no matter where he bowled, because of their depth of their batting, they were pretty confident in going after him and he probably actually took a few wickets just because of that because they were going so hard at him. But maybe they respected him a, a little more this time, none for 16 off three overs. But I think the West Indies are never out of the game just because of the depth of their batting and they've got power hitters all the way through. It was interesting, Pollard said after the game, they might actually have to review the balance of that side. Here's what he had to say to the host broadcast. I just believe that obviously we have to look at, you know, the way we play T20 cricket, you know, again, obviously, you know, our team was set up, you know, for our waiters, you know, to do a lot of the damage, but we weren't able to do that. Um, what we have seen, especially in these conditions, is that, you know, one guy in that top four, you know, try to bat as long as possible. And when you get in, you try to stay in for as long as possible because it's hard for guys to come in and try to hit. So that is one of the things that, you know, going forward, you know, we need to, you know, Know, do better. So Pollard himself, he hit 44 off 31 balls to, I guess, revive the West Indian innings um, and help take 58 off the last five overs, as I mentioned, and um, it gave Australia a, a, a tricky chase. Yes, it did, and as you said, that depth that they've got in their order is pretty impressive, especially when you consider Jason Holder, who has a test double century to his name, is batting at number nine in the order and has barely had a hit this tournament. 100%, 100%, and yeah, maybe as, as Pollard said, it's something they need to to look at and kind of get their get their top order to take a bit more responsibility for, for how these games unfold. So Australia needed 158 to take the win and they needed to do it, you know, in good time to make sure that their net run rate you know, stayed in a good little space. And even though they lost Aaron Finch early to a to Akil Hussain, who was bowling really well with these really difficult to face, in-swinging, off-break sort of things. Um, Filthy uh, arm balls, I think, is the technical term, Joel. <laughs> Filthy arm balls, they were. Yeah, we can go with that. He, he did get Aaron Finch. But after that, David Warner and Mitchell Marsh put on a century stand and Australia got home pretty comfortably in the end. Uh, David Warner, 89 not out. That was his highest score in T20 World Cups. And he's played 28 matches in this format, which is hard to believe. But he was excellent, four sixes and nine fours. Um, it was like the Warner of old, wasn't it? It was. It was his highest T20 score, um, domestic or international, since that series against Sri Lanka two years ago when he absolutely blitzed them. So he uh, he looks to be hitting top form. He um, he bristled. He has bristled at suggestions all tournament that he's been out of form. Uh, he was just out of runs and uh, conditions, and um, you know some of the things going on with the Sunrise Hyderabad had con- conspired against him. But the Aussies would be absolutely delighted that they got a, a big knock out of him. And, gee, he looked great. Um, as you mentioned, Achilles, Achilles Hussain's arm balls were really tricky. Um, they were slow. I mean, they opened with two spinners, but you'd have to say they didn't really um, bowl many spinners, him and Roston Chase, in those first two overs. And, yeah, Warner Warner handled them beautifully. He Once they did bring on Jason Holder a bit of pace, he took 15 off his first over. Um, and he also got Chase away for... Um, 13 and his first over, which um, w- which is really good considering right arm off spin is often an advantage to left-handed batters like Warner. And after that, it was just vintage Warner on the way through, wasn't it? He just looked a, looked the class above. He looked like the, the Warner of old and, you know, he's firing on all cylinders going into the semifinal. He did. He was also very um, keen to employ the reverse sweeps and the switch hits uh, a lot, which we haven't maybe seen a lot from him of late, but in this particular innings, he was very keen to do that and it came off to good effect on, on a number of occasions. There was a great one of even Dwayne Bravo, who was bowling mostly slow balls towards the end where he completely switched his stance over to the a right-handed stance and the ball took so long to get to him. He had to kind of take a, a couple of almost stuttering steps to still be balanced and he still got it away and 
Bravo, uh, who we'll touch on, was playing his last ever game for the West Indies. He could only laugh at it. So Mitch Marsh as well, uh, speaking of reverse sweeps, I mean, I, I mean, we all know Warner does have the capability to, to switch it and, and do that. It's not really something we've seen from Mitch Marsh a lot, but he played a couple of really great ones. First one, he got away for four off, off Hayden Walsh. The second one, I think it was off a keel. Uh, Hayden Walsh stopped it and it would have gone for four um, if, if a less athletic fielder had been there. So um, really awesome signs for, for Mitch Marsh. And it's, um, it's great to see him having really worked on that side of his game. There's, there's been a few people who have talked about the improvements he's had to make against spin and how he's actually sorted out. He, he sorted out Adam Zamper and Ashton Agar before the West Indies series earlier this year and really identified it as an area of improvement. And you can see it starting to pay off now. Yeah, it's certainly been a crew best season for Mitchell Marsh or a crew best year for Mitchell Marsh in the T20 international format. He's hit 550s and he's averaging 41 with the bat since his promotion to number three. And David Warner in the post-match press conference had some good things to say about Marsh's development as well. I'm seeing a very clear mind cricketer. Um, he's coming up, playing his natural game, uh, he's, he's, you know, he's training the house down. He, you know, he's obviously come in at a young age early on, and you know, a lot of people were knocking him. You know, it's it's not it's not our fault that you know sometimes you get selected in teams and you know you try your best every time. But you know, there's certain times now where a lot of the, those players that have been around for a while are, are peaking and, and are finding their straps and and playing with clear minds. And that's exactly what he's doing. His form's been outstanding. He's hitting the ball as clean as anyone in this team. And you can see it happening out in the field, which is fantastic. And I'm, I'm really, really pumped for him. So the match, it became a bit of a formality towards the end. And Gail had kind of been playing this comedic act uh, throughout the whole game. And he kind of started to dominate proceedings um, out in the middle, despite only managing 15 off nine balls. He was kind of centre of attention anyway. Um he came out to bat in what you can only describe as servo sunnies. Um, I think everyone back in Australia would know what we're talking about. They were, uh, I'd never actually seen him bat in sunglasses before. Has he I'd done it before? Yeah, he's definitely rocked them in the IPL, but I'm not sure. Certainly never against Australia, maybe in international cricket, but you're right. They were just these highly reflective, huge sort of things that were plastered on his face, and it just looks you know, a bit ludicrous with the helmet over the top as well and the dreadlocks out the back, but if anyone they, can... They must, be, they must be proper sunnies though, right? Because you wouldn't want to just be rocking some cheap things that you, <laughs> you got from the Shell or the BP on the on the way through, right? Like Because they can really impair your vision if you don't have good sunnies. Yeah, you wouldn't have thought so, not when you're facing 145-kilometre thunderbolt. So, yeah, I'm sure... Well, they might be specialist or prescription or who knows? I'm sure he's got some sort of sunglasses deal. It's Chris Gale after all. Yeah, there might need to be a prescription with a, a 42-year-old facing the lights of, of Mitchell Stark. But the, the whole performance from Gale was a, a bit of a metaphor for his career, really. Like he's um, not in terms of him not having a great game, although he did get the, the wicket of Mitch Marsh at the end. But this kind of idea of him perpetuating himself as this carefree lad who you know doesn't, doesn't take cricket too seriously, I think it belies how seriously he does take cricket. And, you, I mean, you don't play at the top level for two decades. Uh, you don't play 100 tests. You don't make a triple century in test cricket by, you know, not caring about the game. I think he is passionate about West Indies cricket. He's very passionate about his own brand, and, and I mean that sincerely. Like, he's he's really, you know, cultivated this um, this alter ego or this, uh, you know, this, this way of playing the game. So, um, yeah, it, what a career. Um, he, he did suggest that he might actually have another... Um, there might be another swan song coming for him. He, he made it clear that he hadn't retired um, and that there might be one final farewell game in the West Indies uh, in Jamaica. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. It was sort of this weird willy or won't he thing all night, wasn't it? Because Dwayne Bravo, his great mate for all those years, had officially announced that his international cricketing days were done. But Gail, there's a lot of speculation he might be finishing up. But even with all that going around, he did still manage to produce a few little highlights of you know, the iconic Chris Gale, an amazing bat, back foot punch over mid on for six that, I don't know, just pure strength. And then, as you said, he did get a sort of a charity over right at the close of the game and he managed to pick up Mitch Marsh. He was trying to finish the match with a shot over mid off. And now smashed it straight to mid off. Gale has a wicket. What a way to sign off. 
The universe boss comes to hug the man who gave it to and him. And he should have had David Warner as well. I mean, he got Warner kind of overbalancing. I mean, Gale's bowling has always been a little bit better than I think people have given him credit for. He had Warner overbalancing and Puran should have held on to it and maybe if they were a little bit more engaged in you know in the tournament at that point and not having one foot on the plane back home, um, he might have held on to it. But, yeah, then he, he did get Mitch Marsh and Marsh, look, look, he didn't look devastated, but he kind of looked like, oh, I really wish I'd... Um, seen that through and been not out at the end, but then Gail just snuck up on him, sprinted like not sprinted, but kind of ran over to him and embraced him in this big bear hug as he was walking off. And Mitch Marsh didn't look entirely convinced whether he was enjoying it or not. Thankfully, Marsh was smiling though, so I think it it is a you know not a bad look for the game. If Ma- if Marsh sort of pushed him off, it might have been a little bit more <laughs> problematic, but otherwise, I think a good look and a lot of fans enjoyed that moment. Yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, I think we all did, and they got a deserved guard of honour uh, by both teams coming off the ground. Uh, Bravo, we shouldn't forget his legacy in, in this format. He's the all-time leading wicket-taker in T20 cricket. Um, he spoke really well at the press conference afterwards about you know how his career was basically extended when he thought it was over with the West Indies leading into that 2016 uh, World Cup when a lot of these guys who had kind of um, been on the outer uh, due to playing in the IPL and other domestic uh, T20 leagues around the world, and instead of playing for the Windies, they all kind of came back and and won this um, won that great uh, World Cup in in 2016. So, yeah, it, it was great that we got to see him for another you know four to five years of, of international cricket, and and the West Indies will have a, their hands full trying to replace him because his his lower order batting uh, and death bowling is um, is second to none, wasn't it? Definitely, as you said, he's the leading wicket taker in men's T20 cricket. He's got. He, he took 553 wickets, which is more than 120 on second place, which it's going to be a while until he's overtaken but for, you know, at number one. Yeah, it will be. And so the concern for Australia now is Pakistan, who looms as their likely opponent. Uh, by the time you're listening to this, um, you might have seen the Pakistan-Scotland game. We're assuming that Pakistan will have won that and Australia will face them in Dubai, although there does seem to be a a strange clause in the ICC's match regulations that suggest that India, if they qualify, have to play in Dubai. So the the, uh, location of that game is yet to be 100% confirmed. But yeah, I mean, I I think the really interesting one is Australia have have basically settled on playing their three fast bowlers and, and just one specialist spinner. Um, they could bring back Ashton Agar, but you'd really think it couldn't be at the expense of Mitch Marsh now, given how well he's going. Um, and I think it's not unusual. It's not an unusual tactic in terms of fielding three specialist fast bowlers. As we were talking off air before, it's um, Pakistan have got Hassan Ali, uh, Harris Ralph, and Shaheen Shah Afridi. Um, New Zealand have gone with Milne, Bolt, and Saudi. Uh, England have three, you know, have, have changed a little bit with Tamal Mills going out for Wood, but they've got three specialist quicks as well. The one thing Australia don't have is that off-spinning all-rounder. Um, you know, you'd, Ahmad Wazim does it for, for Pakistan, Moeen Ali does it for England, uh, Mitch Santner to an extent um, does it for New Zealand and, you know, Ashton Agar, there's, there's probably just not that spot. So uh, whether they have to rely a bit more on Glenn Maxwell going into that next game, I think that fifth bowler spot is still the the question mark a little bit for the Aussies. Yeah, just looking at the Pakistan 11, they've been unchanged for all of their four matches so far. And there are a lot of right-handers in that top order. Rizwan, Baba, Shoaib Malik, Muhammad Hafiz, they're all right-handers. So there will be a little bit of food for thought there for the Aussie coaches. I mean, they made a big deal about the matchups. That was the reason Agar came in for the England game earlier in the tournament. So I'm sure they will be considering it. We've said it a couple of times that you'd think Pat Cummins would be the one if they wanted to go in with seven batters and four bowlers and wanted to play two spinners as well. You'd think Pat Cummins is, might be the odd man out, but I just don't know if they're prepared to prepared to do that for a semi final to drop uh, your three million dollar IPL man. Um, you know, not that that comes into the calculations, but um, yeah, I mean to make a, a decision like that or to drop one of their batters, uh, you know, it might be Smith or or even Stoinis is in the gun if, if that was the case. To drop one of those guys for a World Cup semi-final would be a, a really big call. It certainly would. But maybe Australia have to make the big calls, Lou, if they want to knock off one of these tournament favourites. And Pakistan have looked so, so good, haven't they? Yeah. I, I think the Aussies have got to stick to their guns. I think they've come this far down the road with with what they've done. I'd be really surprised if they made a, a bombshell statement like that. 
Um, and, you know, Mitch Marsh, you'd think he's indispensable now. Um, he's had a fantastic year in T20 cricket. Um, I can't see it happening, but uh, I've been wrong before, Josh. <laughs> very rare, though. Very rare, isn't it? Um, so the other semi final is looking like it could be England and New Zealand, although if Afghanistan do upset New Zealand uh, tonight, as of when we are recording this, then India do have a chance to slide into second spot. Um, what do you think is going to happen on that side of the draw, Louis? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I heard an interesting theory that India might have uh, done well to actually not beat Afghanistan by as much as they did in their um, in Afghanistan's most most recent game in in Abu Dhabi, where India made two for two hundred and ten, passing two hundred for the first time in this tournament, and Afghanistan uh, only managed one hundred and forty four in reply. That's kind of set them up for their last game against New Zealand, where they need to absolutely thump them to be a chance of going through, which you would think would increase New Zealand's chances of winning, right? Because Afghanistan, they're they're a good side, but their hopes of, I think, absolutely demolishing New Zealand are pretty small. And you think if they play in a really cavalier, reckless way, that increases New Zealand's chance of winning and therefore reduces India's hopes of being able to leapfrog them. So that's a really interesting scenario, whether whether India might have thought about that. Um, You know, you're kind of tempting fate by by being able to control things like that. But, yeah, if, if New Zealand win their final game against Afghanistan, then, then India are knocked out. So India will be cheering on Afghanistan, but not for them to win by too much. So Australia are in the semifinals of the Men's T20 World Cup. Those semifinals will be in the very early hours of Thursday and Friday morning for Australian viewers. And then the final will be in the very early hours of next Monday. So hopefully we'll check in with some good news after Australia's semi-final. But this has been another edition of the Unplayable Podcast. Thanks, Louis. We'll catch you next time.